This is Thank You Mama Weekly Lessons for Mothers All Around the World. Hi and welcome to Thank You Mama. My name is Anna Tider and I am super excited about my guest today because... A, today's Veterans Day, and my guest is a combat veteran. And B, she's just so amazing. Hi, Julianne. <laughs> Welcome. Hello, Anna. <laughs> Thank you. So, Julianne <laughs> is a Dr. Julianne Shin, and Julianne has been with Marines for 24 years. She mm-hmm. went into combat twice in Iraq. Julianne is also a wife and a mama of a beautiful boy. And she, mm-hmm. at one stage, decided to ro- change her paths and wrote a PhD about mothers in combat. And I am mad about this topic. <laughs> I can't wait. This must become a book, Julianne. But we'll talk about it <laughs> offline. <laughs> sure. Um And so Julianne became a Navy psychologist and Mm -hmm. she is, I'm sorry, please don't hate me for saying this, beautiful and she's kind and sweet (laughs) and I have a total crush on you, Julianne. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) And so what, do I tell you happy Veterans Day today? Uh, I suppose so. I think people have that confused sometimes because I'm technically not a veteran. I'm active duty. So I guess I'm a Marine Corps veteran, but I'm active duty Navy now. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Do you want to add anything? Did I miss something? Do you want to tell me more about maybe about your coaching? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, uh, I just recently transitioned from the Na- um, Marine Corps to the Navy to be a psychologist uh, like a month ago. And um, the reason I became a psychologist because of my combat experience in the Marine Corps. And also I, d- during the pandemic, uh, similar to a lot of other people, I started doing coaching and it's been such a passion of mine because I'm able to reach people in a different way, in a more authentic way. Um, and I focused on my initial population. I focused on were mama entrepreneurs and and professional women that work that also balance family. And so what now I do, what I do on the side now, I I call myself the mindset cured doc because I'm able to help people learn how to be more emotionally and mentally uh, resilient, which is a key to how I've survived my last 25 years. I was just thinking about it. I was like, of course, if I had to choose a coach, of course, I will go to a coach who has been through things like you've been. I, I'm proud to say this, that it took me a long time to get to this point, but I've taken my adverse situations and experiences as well as my failures, and I have turned them around to, um, I guess, invent a, a, a new me that is able to help others in a way that I wouldn't have been able to if I didn't have those experiences. So that's all combined with like how with, with this mother talk. So this is actually a good segue. Mm. <laughs> what did you see as your failures? Oh, goodness gracious. That's so funny that you asked that because I think a lot of people who are uh, high performers, they don't see themselves as high performers. And it's all, again, it's going to tie back to the way I was raised and with my mother's influence that I was always pushed to be a high performer. Um, So because I never could please her, it was a continuous subconscious action forward to always try to do the best, but I felt like I wasn't ever doing enough. So that led me to this constant, I guess, uh, achieving these high, high uh, goals that I didn't realize were such high goals Mm -hmm. until like, like, like the last few years. So for me, the failures, when I say failures, just decisions that I've made in my personal life and just decisions that I've made in career. I mean, there's, there's been, my career was never straight. They were going, it was like a weaving type of maze that I went through. So career decisions and personal decisions that I consider failures and were painful at the time, but have become a part of me and how I help others in their path. Julian, what yeah. I find very interesting because I went through this and my mom went through this is exactly what you just mentioned, Mm -hmm. where helping people realize that having a very diverse professional background 
can be a strength. Mm-hmm. We we are always told in schools you need this beautiful, straightforward CV. You know this this beautiful <laughs> story of climbing up your ladder, and then when you feel <laughs> the need to change, you feel scared of that, and you think you are doing something wrong, like I did when yeah. after acquiring my MBA and working in this amazing mm-hmm. corporate jobs for what fifteen years. Mm-hmm. I felt like mm-hmm. I this is not good for me anymore. I want to be a writer. And I had horrendous bad conscience. Like it, I, I was, <laughs> I really thought I'm destroying myself in my life. And oh, I think yes. it's amazing that you just mentioned that. And this is something yeah. where you can support people in understanding it's good. Absolutely. I think also from immigrant parents, they have the strong philosophy of you follow one path and you Mm -hmm. just, the goal is to just work Mm -hmm. hard and make enough money to provide the best for your children. So the the traditional way of growing your, your life is, is something that people valued and thought that was the only way to go. Mm -hmm. So myself, because I was so different, my parents were always concerned (laughs) Mm because I always seemed to want to go my own way. But it has benefited me to this point. I'm 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 a happier person. I'm a whole person. I'm doing something that means something to me and that I value um, versus my sister who did that path and tried to follow that path. And then she's, she's always high stress, depressed, always busy, never gets to spend time with the family. So it just, when I just look at my own family dynamic and things that I've learned from my parents, this path right here to follow what you believe in and what you value, even if it wasn't how you were raised, it it makes so much of a difference with your quality of life. It does. And did you notice what I noticed when I made that hard decision? And thankfully, my mom was really supporting me in that. Mm-hmm. The moment I quit the job and said, okay, I'll figure it out how I'm going to pay my bills, but I'm mm-hmm. a writer now. Yeah. Yeah. The universe started opening doors for me. And it was ah, seriously like yes. magic was happening. I've never experienced this kind of, I don't have another word for it, magic in my life where every door I would knock on would be like, of course, hello, you know, you want to publish yes. with us. And and amazing things were opening up. Like every step I took, three other amazing things opened up. And I really became a believer in following, recognizing your own life and your own path and just following it because from my experience it's it's magical that is so i'm so glad you brought that up because it's something that's very hard for a lot of people to believe when they've been stuck in what they call i call a matrix and there it's a lot of fear to go into that path but when you do that when you finally open up and you let you let that mental emotional space in uh, like open up it it allows for all those opportunities to come in. But when you're working the grind and you're stuck in something that you think you believe is what you should be doing, you are not leaving space for opportunities. So when you, when you personally, you, when you let that go and you decided to go that path, you allowed the, the, the space for the universe to come in and give you what you really valued. It's hard for a lot of people to, to embrace that. It is. And it sounds like spiritual gibberish when we talk about it. But yeah, I see I know. <laughs> I've experienced it, you know. <laughs> and yeah, I've seen agreed. I've seen my mom who at sixty two decided to do a completely new thing. She's never done before. She decided to direct oh. <clears throat> sorry, direct and just completely edit and direct her own art movie. And she was sixty two. Wow. And this movie, she started winning awards with it and going to to (gasps) film festival, international film festivals and a museum, a big museum bought it for their permanent collection. And it's again, this this proof that A, it's never too late. And B, if you really follow it, it's, you know, if you have the guts and do this courageous thing, it's it, it will pay off. Exactly. And I've just seen so many people that get stuck and they get too afraid to do what they really want because yeah. it's it's un, it's very unfamiliar to them. Exactly. And you need to leave safety behind. And that's hard. I remember, you know, mm-hmm. the idea of I was so used to having this well-paid, safe job and everything. It's, yeah. it's scary. Yeah. It's scary. It, it is. It is scary. I have two things before we jump into mom talk. First, I was just thinking when I was plugging in my microphone, I'm like, how do men react when they know you're a trained 
a train. Oh. <laughs> you know, like, do they get scared and nervous? Do they find it fascinating or do they run away when you go on a date and you're like, you know, I'm trained to kill people. <laughs> You know, it's funny because um, it's the complete opposite. Oh, so is it? <laughs> wow. Dating was was like was was I I I didn't always tell people what I did because it it was um, too much of an attraction. I guess. I mean, it, I guess they find it sexy. I don't know. <laughs> but you see, that kills so, this idea that men are scared of of strong women, which is good. Agreed. Exactly. Yeah. We like that. Absolutely. We like yeah. no, men absolutely. to find <laughs> strong women sexy. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> exactly. <Yes. laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> okay. And my second question is, tell me more about your PhD. I'm really <laughs> interested about it. So it's about mothers. Oh, yes. So um, I initially started writing just about women who went to combat and their experiences. But then when I, I got pregnant, I said, you know what? I I, I I don't know what their experience is like. And because of going through my own pregnancy and having a baby, I'm like, I was like, how do people do this in the military? Um, so I changed my topic to uh, mothers that had been deployed or and, and uh, had little children when they left. And wow, the, just the stories that I heard were so moving. And at the... Um, at the at the commitment and tenacity and the 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 strength these women had to try to retain their relationship and try to continue caring for their child in the way they wanted to, no matter the distance or the likes. Um, the the best example that, I, that comes to the forefront of my mind is the one that she was fortunately an officer, so she had more control of uh, the aviation side. And so she went to, I think, Bahrain or Iraq, I don't remember, mm -hmm. but she was able, she was still pumped. And she she found some freezer boxes and put got some dry ice, wrapped it tightly. She like like worked with pilots to have it shipped back home to the States. Are you serious? And she pumped milk while she was in I'm Iraq so, and sent her, that's yeah. amazing. Yes. Wow. I know. And she I don't know how many ounces she would do at a time, but she filled a big cooler each time and then would, you know, Whoa. work with the pilots to yes. do this. I yes. know, right? And um, amazing. Just Women things like that. Amazing. It just blew my mind. I know. Yes, I agree, right? <laughs> yes. I mean, just pumping is hard. Like I mean, yeah. for me, pumping and breastfeeding was such an emotional experience for yes. me. And I was I felt um betrayed and and I felt like my body was not doing what it should do. And then when I finally got into it and I also worked, I was like, how do people in uh, on active duty do this when they get deployed? And wow. I'm telling you, mothers just come up with the craziest things to make it happen. Wow. <laughs> amazing. No, I'm, I told you I'm going to push you until this is published as a book. <laughs> but let's go to our main topic. Let's go to your mom, Mom Corazon, yes. who is yes. from uh, Philippines. She's, she's um, from the Philippines and she migrated here when she was, um, I think, in her late mid-30s. Yes, mid-30s, because she was following her sisters, her two sisters who were already here, and they told her she should come out. So mm -hmm. she followed them. And your dad is Korean? Yes. He came from Korea at, at about 30, a late age too, like late 30s. Okay. And he was um, a dentist, and my mother was a teacher, and uh, they just happened to meet. I don't know how they got connected because my father could barely speak English, oh. so I'm not sure how that happened. But. And they met in the States? <laughs> They did. They met in Chicago, Illinois. Yes. Okay. And they had two daughters. They did. My sister, who is two years younger than I am. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, so, and then I came, I, I was first in 77 and my sister followed in 79. She came from a very dysfunctional family, a family of eight, I think. And then her mother was a very strong business woman. She was one of very well-known name. So they had money wherever they were in their village and in the Philippines. And she was a very strong businesswoman, owned multiple businesses, um, always doing some other new entrepreneur thing. So I think that kind of carries down with the family. And then my, my grandfather was a very, he was more of a gentler man who pretty much just did whatever his wife wanted. And unfortunately, I think from what I understand the experiences that they tell me, it sounds like that she had um, a bipolar issue along with some health issues like asthma. So yeah. when they talk about their mother, it's with a very resentful attitude. I don't think I recall much 
good things that they would tell me. Um, so I guess my mother was supposedly the black sheep. So she was always rejected. So she held that. She carried that. And so it carried on into her parenting with us. And to the point where my father told me later in life, when in my 20s, that he wanted more children after my sister. But after seeing the way my mother was after having us, he didn't want to do that to any more children. And what I take from that is that she was probably experiencing some kind of postpartum mm-hmm. um, from the the, the symptoms. The, things they were telling me about, or my, my father was telling me. So I didn't understand that then, but now, you know, being a mother, I get that. And I think that's what was happening. So that's, that's why my father was like, okay, no more children. So if that's an any indicator, how my, my life started, it wasn't easy for her to be a mom. And mm-hmm. I, I, looking back, I can see that's what happened. So it's, it, she didn't really have the best role model as a mother. And then she went through some emotional stuff after she had, had me. So I don't even know where you would begin to learn what was going on with yourself. Mm. So as much as I saw her strength trying to build the family up and take care of my dad, my father was the main breadwinner because he was a dentist. I never saw them there. They had the, the, the traditional Asian philosophy of working 80, 90 hours a week. Oh. So I never saw them. She worked as well. She so she did. So she supported him. And then I for, I kind of have a, a vague memory of what happened, but something happened. I guess his business was not doing as well. So they started other businesses. They mm-hmm. opened up an ice cream shop. They had a cleaners. They had a property. So I was just, we were just kind of being dragged around if they couldn't find a sitter. And we worked all holidays. And I just, that's all I remember. So for that, I really admired the commitment they had in trying to keep the family going and giving us the best of school and homes, they really had good intentions to make sure they gave the best to their family. But the price was not not having, not giving the giving us what children really need is is the time and the emotional support and the feelings of safety and love and trust. Mm-hmm. All those were the price that they that that we paid for for their commitment. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's interesting to me though when we stick to traditional values that sometimes those traditions are not are not functional they don't serve us well and i think with a lot of families and and mothers like old school mothers you know they they what they've grown up with their traditions and what they believe in as far as a culture they stick to it so hard that a lot of the children come out having such a hard time dealing with their own lives as they grow into adults because they were so rigid in their thinking that they just raised their children the way they have always thought they should be raised. So fortunately, I feel grateful to have learned from that and not taken it on into my own life. And you left quite at quite a young age. You left home at 17. How did you decide to leave and to leave for the Navy? Um, I... I had been trying to get away from home for a while because it was a very dysfunctional, violent, angry childhood home. I didn't feel safe. School was my way to get get away. So it was it was kind of um, a natural progression that I would that as soon as someone told me about the military, I think it was a friend I, I just met. I didn't know nothing about the military, nothing. And and as soon as she said it, she said the Marine Corps. And I was like, oh, what's that? And so, of course, when I meet these recruiters in these handsome uniform, of course, I'm going to say yes. I mean, <laughs> how can I say no to that? <laughs> I mean, there's such a the Marine Corps. I don't know anything about the Marine Corps, but they're so about the way um, about looks like we're so about pristine about our uniforms mm-hmm. and about the way we present ourselves. So, yeah, they sell themselves very well. And at 17, that's that's wow, you know, that's amazing. So I immediately jumped on that. And I had to wait about a month before my parents would sign the papers because I was so young. And I was so scared that I wasn't going to be able to go. So I was, I feel fortunate enough that I left at that age. That was a very, um, it's, it's the reason why I, I feel like I am, I'm functioning better today than I would have if I stuck, stuck mm-hmm. around. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Julian, are they still alive? Yes. Yes, yes. They, are. They, they are. They're, um, uh, almost 80s. Yeah, my father's like 83. My oh, mother, wow. I think she's 79. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So mm-hmm. they're still, they're still, they're very healthy and moving around. Like, um, I, I keep forgetting how old they are because they're still, they're still picking things up and cutting <laughs> the grass. And it's, 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 <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, let's jump into lessons. And I think you already mentioned the first one. Yes. Yeah. And if I could say a little bit more about that one too. Um, yes, please do. Let's talk about lessons, which as you mentioned, you she didn't teach you directly, but indirectly. No. <laughs> it's what I wish she taught me. Absolutely indirectly. Yeah, absolutely indirectly. And um, if it was, if I had not found myself, I probably would not, I would not have been able to get these lessons. But because I did, and now after being a psychologist and um, having my own child, she's taught me how, how much of an influence a mother's relationship can be on the child from the very beginning and how it can last through a lifetime. I had no idea that all these feelings that I had, pain, the loneliness, the mistrust, the lack of security, all of these things that's, that children need as a toddler, as a baby growing up, I didn't realize the importance of them and how much they impacted my mindset as I was getting older. Because now that I look back, the military, I was able to push through the military and I did well, but it wasn't without struggle, a lot of struggle, a lot of pain. It was very, very hard for me. You would just never be able to tell on the outside. I didn't trust myself. I didn't trust others. I felt like could never, I could never please my superiors. I, I, I was, it was, it was, it's, it's insane. All the feelings that I had that my, my mother instilled in me because she didn't give me the proper support and love and support I needed, it carried through my entire life. And I didn't, I didn't even get out of that cycle until I'm 43 now, so maybe at 30s, maybe late 30s, so not too long ago when I realized what was happening to me. So now with my child, I am so conscious of making sure he knows that he's important, that he's loved, and th and that not judged, that he'll always have my love and support no matter what. All these things, I just, I didn't realize how valuable and important they were to a growing child when they're, when they're young. They're so, they're taking in and soaking in everything. And our job as parents is to provide this foundation for them so that the rest of their lives does not feel like a big, scary thing. And that's mm -hmm. what happened to me. The world was a big, scary mm -hmm. thing. And, and I couldn't try trust anybody. So as far as that relationship with my mother, I feel like if I had gotten that feeling of being loved, uh, supported, I'd never be abandoned, um, that I always had somebody that I could trust to lean on, I would have been able to function a lot more healthier than I did. Um, that's, that would take like a long time for me to talk about how unhealthy I did, <laughs> did but it wasn't, it wasn't an easy life for me. That's when I, I try to share that with other mothers, just when they're trying to figure out their relationship with their children, because it's just, it's so important. It, it blows my mind how sensitive young babies are or young children as they're growing up. Mm. I'm sometimes a little nervous that I'm doing too much of that. <laughs> I'm like, you can do yeah. everything you want. You are so amazing. You, you're strong. Yeah. You know, it's like, whoops. <laughs> Yes. Nick Nick blames yes, it on my I, Croatian I, side. He's like, you're a total Croatian mama. Yes. So in love with your son. <laughs> yes. No, it's so true though. We we get we get to that point. I was like, I actually talked about that with my husband. I said, because he's a very uh, he came from a very healthy, strong family, very well balanced. And I told that to him. I said, I'm afraid I'm gonna be too extreme either way. Yes. And I need you to help me find that middle yes. ground. Because mm -hmm. I don't want to be too too giving and I don't want to be too mean. <laughs> <laughs> Julian, yes. let's jump into lesson number two, which is interesting to me because, yeah, I'll let you talk about it. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Not holding on to the pain from your parents. So from my personal experience is I, I, this has been a lifetime work and I'm much better than I was even five years ago. Um, and I see this with my, my mother who still holds the pain from her mother. It carries through to the way you parent. It carries through to how you interact with your spouse and with your friends and your children. It's, it, 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 again, it's part of this whole how she didn't give me the things I needed as a child to support myself. It, it causes like a lifetime of pain, really, and in and, and relationships that are dysfunctional because you don't know how to have a a healthy functioning relationship. My mother to this day, my mother and her sisters, they hold so much resentment for their mother and it's caused them to be against each other, to fight over things that happened 50 years ago, to 
to be depressed about it and then they'll use it as an excuse about why they are a difficult person, to put it nicely. They'll always put the blame on their mother and it blows my mind because they're all in their 60s, 70s and 80s. And so I took that lesson to my own life and I have worked and worked and worked to get past that pain, to try to have a better understanding of where my mother came from and why she was the way she is. And it's true. There's a certain amount. Uh, the person can't change unless they want to change. So that's that's another thing that I always try to remember that. No matter how much I talk to her about it, no matter how much I try to give my insight, it, she's going to believe what she wants to believe. And um, her lack of self-awareness, it keeps her in a state of depression a lot and unhappiness. And she's very negative. And I don't want to be that way. And and, and that, that has been my, my goal. So in that lesson is not to hold the pain that she she gave me as a child and because I don't want that to be me. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not me. Mm-hmm. But obviously it's easier said than done. I just wanted to say that yeah. You sometimes you need professional help with that because sometimes you're not even aware yes. what hurts you. Like it's it's no. it's some it's, it, I don't want to say mm-hmm. it's easier or simple but when it's obvious then you know what you have to work on but often it's not obvious you don't where know. this pain comes from and what, what hurt you or what hurt your mother and you inherited. It. No, you don't. Mm-mm. I interviewed a lady who works with it. Her, her topic is healing the mother wound. And it was extremely oh. interesting talking about how certain pains and patterns sometimes yeah. get inherited from generation to generation. Like she said, you have to look yeah. at your grandmother, you know, and see where, what, just look at it yes. and analyze and see what feelings are being inherited throughout generations and it, heal that. Yeah, I think that's some, there's actually a, um, a scientific term for that, like generational, um, generational. I forget what it's called. Um, I guess you could put any word in there, but generational anything is a true mm. thing. I mean, it can, mm. pa- it can pass down. If you don't realize, if you don't, mm-hmm. if you don't recognize what's happening, and it can become uh, a cycle if mm-hmm. if you don't break yourself out mm-hmm. of it, which is I, I've I've did, I've I've done it so far, and I I plan on continuing to keep the cycle broken. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And forgiving, I think that's also a big big part in all of that. Oh, oh my gosh, yes, <sighs> absolutely. Forgiving is yeah. it took a long time, but once you forgive, it it also weighs the weight is off you as well. Yes. Once you forgive, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let's jump into the last one. Yes. Um, so I've talked a lot about this. I think I mentioned a few minutes ago about my mother not being self-aware. So emotional intelligence is something that I teach as part of my coaching as well. It, it involves a lot, but I think the most important as far as right now is being self-aware of your emotions and how they are serving you and where they come from. I think those three three things about emotional intelligence. My mother did not come from a, a time that even even consider feelings a, a a factor like mm-hmm. it, it was just you just did you just did what you had to do to survive and you went to school you know you 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 helped your family and that was it so um, emotions were almost like weak so from her not being emotionally aware of what was happening it really impacted everything else so I think it pretty much encompasses everything I just I've discussed in the last 20 minutes she wasn't aware how her own emotions throughout my entire life affected the way she interacted with me, interacted with my sister, how she saw the world. It caused uh, my sister and I to have just a hard time trying to figure things out for us as we got older. Um, So now um, when I look at that and I think about that, I'm very aware now with how my feelings as a mother impacts the way I see what my my child does. I mean, he's only two, but you know, when you're frustrated and you're tired, or your husband upsets you, or something, <laughs> you know, you, you can react in a way to your child that that wasn't necessary. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. a, a child doesn't understand that. A child doesn't mm-hmm. understand why you did that. All they see is that you know, I made mommy mad, or mm-hmm. I made mommy cry, or mm-hmm. I made mommy sad, and and then they attribute it to themselves. They think mm-hmm. they did it, mm-hmm. and and that. That was my cycle with my mother, that, that I felt like I was always the one responsible for her, her her pain. And I don't ever want my tiny child to ever feel that and carry mm-hmm. that weight. I think that encompasses really everything I've talked about so far. But it is something that I, I, um, 
I, I make sure to incorporate into all of my coaching and all of, with all my patients as a Navy psychologist, because it helps people be more aware of how their emotions can impact how they interact with other people. Most, I think, majority of population are not very aware. They, we kind of go, we kind of go with the flow and just kind of walk through life without really thinking about where we play a role in in this world and how we impact those around us. Um, and it makes me sad. <laughs> That's what they said. <laughs> We're working on waking up. <laughs> We're yes, working step by yeah. step. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But one thing I do want to say, and I know that I talked a lot about her not teaching me anything, but I, I, I fortunately had the wonderful experience of having the mother that I always wanted when she helped me take care of my son for a month. I was afraid about <laughs> how it was going to be because we've never gotten along, but it, he was only a few months old and I was struggling to learn how to, you know, put a baby to sleep. And, uh, you know, I was nervous about doing different things with him because he's my first child. And I, I have to say she, she made me feel like, like a relationship that I never had with her. So fortunately I'm able to replace or kind of at least kind of, um, start my life differently with my child because she treated, I think, I think a lot of people say this, she treats my grandson, uh, my son, differently than she did with me. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. so just watching that love and then having her help me through it. Mm -hmm. Um, it was, it was very, very meaningful considering I never really got a lot of that when I was growing up. So I just wanted to end on a good, a good note. (laughs) Isn't it the most beautiful present our mothers can give us? Because my mom flew from Croatia to Los Angeles to be with me. And uh, yeah, she yeah. stayed with me for, she planned to stay for three months. I think she stayed for four months or something like that. And wow. it meant so much for me at that stage, although I was already 40 and the person I was, mm-hmm. it meant so tremendously much that I was somebody's child yes. in the moment when I yes. became a mom. And it, oh. I think this is one of the yes. biggest presents our moms, moms of women can give their daughters is this presence and this help when I they agree. become moms? That's really beautiful. Oh my gosh! It was. It was. I. I never thought I would have it, and to 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 re, to actually feel like a loved daughter. Yes. Like it was just. Yes. It was. It was amazing. Like yes. And, and she she went out of her comfort zone to take a train by herself, which she's never done and never never traveled by herself to come stay with me. Uh, like I think two or three months. Like she would skip a month, go home, and then come back. I was so impressed by her love she had for my, grand, my her grandchild, and and she made me feel important for the first time in my life. Oh, so that's yes, I, it's so important that relationship. Yeah, it's so important. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for thank you for that. I'm very happy we we ended on the happy note. <laughs> yes, I had to. I had to. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to add, Julian? Um, I don't think so. Um, I, I guess just um, if anybody's interested in, in reaching out to me, to ask questions or to know more about um, uh, about what I do, then they're more than welcome to reach out on me uh, to me on Facebook to send me a message. Um, I just hope that uh, my message might be able to help other people out there. And I so appreciate you, Anna, for for uh, having me on your show. This means so much to me. It's been an honor to to be here. Thank you so much for being my guest. And uh, we will put a link to your Facebook, some kind of a link of how okay. how the listeners can get in touch with you in episode notes. Sure. And absolutely. Thank you for being my guest. Yes. Thank you, Anna. If you enjoy Thank You Mama and want to help it grow, please take the two seconds to leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps. If you'd like to get in touch, you can send me a mail at info at thankyoumama.net. You can also find me on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter under Anna Tider. that's T-A-J-D-E-R. This was Thank You Mama. Come back next week, subscribe and tell your friends. <laughs>